from Nashville's First Church of the Nazarene, you are invited to join us in worship with The Real Life. Located downtown at 510 Woodland Street on the east bank of the Cumberland River, the life of Christ received, shared together, and extended to others with passion. For the next half hour, let us share the life of Christ together through the clear Bible teaching of Pastor Kevin M. Ullett. Let's go into the worship now.
Amen. Tell you what, I'm excited about that day that he's coming back again. But until then, I'm looking forward to just working with him here in his kingdom. How about you? And this is exciting to be in the Easter season. And let's see if you know this as well as the Russians do. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Well trained, Pastor. That's very good. That is exciting. This is a season we don't want to forget that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and we have the joy and the privilege of celebrating that over and over and over again. And I am excited to be in church today because I get to celebrate a risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Tell you what, Easter became an incredible season for us as we were missionaries in the former Soviet Union. Over there in that part of the world where they had pretty much outlawed Christianity for 70 years, we had no Christmas for 70 years, the only religious holiday we were allowed to celebrate was Easter. And it was amazing because even the Eastern Orthodox Church and all of the Protestants, they all decided we're going to celebrate on the same day, even though they had different calendars. And that was the one time of the year that all of Christianity stepped out and said, we're going to celebrate our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And those Russian people taught me how exciting it was to have one celebration for Christianity and to say, I serve a risen Savior, Jesus. And this morning, I just want to kind of talk to you about where I've been in my spiritual journey. It was a couple of years ago, I was going to go speak at a church, and a pastor friend of mine sent me this one slide that I have with me this morning. It says, are you my neighbor? Local, global, and everything in between. And, um, and, and this friend said, now, this is going to be the theme of our service, and could you take this picture and kind of just imagine what you could do with that and, and how God could help you to speak using this picture? Well, the only thing that came to my mind was Dr. Seuss. And I thought, you know, well, and I, I thought, so how do I do that? And, and you know, interestingly, and I'm, I'm glad the kids are in here today because I decided maybe there was something to the gospel of Dr. Seuss. And, and I found this book that uh, I thought, well, maybe this relates a little bit to what this person wanted me to talk about. And this was Dr. Seuss's very first children's book that he ever wrote. And it's called, And to Think That I Saw It on Mulberry Street. Has anybody ever read this book? Few people have read this book. Yes, you know this book. Well, you know, I, I began to read this book and I thought, okay, so would that relate anything to what maybe God might want us to say sometimes? I think Dr. Seuss actually had some pretty good gospel in some of the things that he talked about. And, um, and it's a story about a little boy named Marco. And this little boy named Marco, he would walk home from school every day. And his dad would always say to him, Marco, keep your eyelids up and see what you can see. But when I tell him where I've been and what I think I've seen, he looks at me and sternly says, your eyesight's much too keen. Stop telling such outlandish tales. Stop turning minnows into whales. Now, what can I say when I get home today? So all the long way to school and all the way back, I've looked and I've looked and I've kept careful track, but all that I've noticed except my own feet was a horse and a wagon on Mulberry Street. And to be honest, little Marco was a little bit disappointed that this was the only thing that he got to see. There wasn't a lot to see on Mulberry Street. And so he began to just let his imagination go wild with him. And he began to think, maybe I could see more things. And his story just began to grow. And he began to see things like zebras on Mulberry Street. Now, eventually, and I'm not going to take you through the whole book, but his story gets really, really, really large. And he begins to see all kinds of things on Mulberry Street. All the way from, he says, the mayor is there. And he thinks it's grand. And he raises his hat as they dash to the stand. The mayor is there, too. And the alderman, too all waving big banners of red, white, and blue. And that is a story that no one can beat when I say that I saw it on Mulberry Street. So little Marco, he's so excited, he gets home. He says, I swung around the corner and I dashed through the gate. I ran up the steps and I felt simply great for I had a story that no one could beat and to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street. Well, you know what? There are times in life when we are given a vision to see much more than what maybe the ordinary eye may see. There are times that our eyes are open and we see these things that are on our street that are beyond the things that we would normally think ought to be there. Little Marco did. Well, let me take you to the scripture this morning. And I'm gonna take you to Acts chapter 26. I wanna take you to the Apostle Paul. 
The Apostle Paul has now been captured and he's in Caesarea and he's being held there in this city and I think he was held there for two or three years and, and, and finally he's gonna stand before Felix and he's gonna tell him his witness story and, and he's getting here and he's gonna tell his story to this man, I mean to Agrippa, and he, um, and he begins to share his personal testimony and this is where we learn about Paul's conversion experience. Acts chapter 26, starting with verse 9, this is what Paul says. Indeed, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things against the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Or maybe he was convinced he ought to do a lot of things against the Nazarenes. And that is what I did in Jerusalem with authority received from the chief priests. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison, but I also cast my vote against them when they were being condemned to death. By punishing them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme, and since I was so furiously enraged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. With this in mind, I was traveling to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priests. When at midday, along the road, your excellency, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and my companions. When we had fallen on the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It hurts you to kick against the goads. And I answered, who are you, Lord? The Lord answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this person, this purpose, to appoint you to serve and testify to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. After that, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and then in Jerusalem and throughout the countryside of Judea and also to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do deeds consistent with repentance." Paul's Damascus Road experience, the great light from heaven, and Jesus Christ giving him a vision to see things that none of those people around him saw that day. Paul had a vision. And finally he realizes, I cannot be disobedient to the vision that I have from heaven. I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life that God has given me some visions to see things. And sometimes those things have been troubling to see those things. We were missionaries in the former Soviet Union for 13 years. We lived in the city of Moscow during that time. And I will never forget after we'd lived there for about five or six years, something kind of strange started to happen. It's one of those visions that haunts me to this day because I did not understand what was going on. As we would drive up to the north end of town and we would head up on the highway to the Shiri Mitchell Airport, which is the major international airport on the north end of town, we would go there frequently. We had a lot of guests that would come in and out of the city. But one day as we're driving down that highway, I notice on the side of the road, there's like four, five, six teenage girls just sort of lined up standing on the road. I thought, that seemed really strange. What are those girls doing out here on this highway? Well, the next time I went to the airport, there were about 20 teenage girls lined up on the side of the road. I thought, what is going on in my city? And every time I went to the airport, there were more, and there were more, and there were more, and I've never seen anything like this before in my life until it got to the point where I'm serious, there'd be a hundred girls on one side and a hundred girls on the other and buses parked behind them and the men standing around with guns controlling a human meat market on my highway. And that vision has haunted me for years. And I would drive by and I would say, God, 
what am I as a Christian supposed to do about this? Let me tell you, it's pretty scary business. I have just a little picture from, that's from Moscow, from the streets. But eventually, um, I thought, you know, how do, how do I deal with this? What do I do with it? And I would only see it when I went to the airport, and yet, this next slide is from my street. This is a street I lived on in Moscow. Ulitsa Mariulianovoy. And you can't see it, this is the boulevard on the side, there's high-rise apartment buildings. And um, one night the business moved into our neighborhood. And right at the end of that street where my kids would walk to go to school every day, there's a park. And at night there would be 30 to 40 girls for sale at the end of my street. I'm still haunted by the vision of what I saw on Maria Yulianovi Street. And I would go by with my little girls and they'd say, Mommy and Daddy, what's going on on our street? It was scary business. People would say, couldn't you just go out and rescue girls? No, you couldn't. This is some of the most powerful mafia business in the world. It is controlled by some of the most evil forces in the world that you can imagine. And I used to pray and say, oh God, what do I do about what's happening on my street? We, we came to America that summer and we were on furlough and as we traveled across the country, that vision still haunted me. I really didn't say much about it. And little did I know that my 10-year-old daughter was incredibly troubled by the girls that she knew could not be set free on Maria Yulianovi Street. At the end of the summer, my daughter comes up to me and she hands me an envelope and I said, what is this? She said, Mommy, I've been collecting money all summer long in Sunday school classes and places that I've been and here's $200 to buy Bibles for the girls on Maria Yulianovi Street. My daughter, at least she knew that they desperately needed Jesus Christ. When we came back from furlough, the town had been cleaned up and the girls were gone. I'm sure they've just been moved to some other place. But it's a vision that has haunted me for about 15 years. There's another vision that haunts me. It was a day that I traveled to the south of Russia to an area called the Saratov region. And around that Saratov region are old German villages that used to be called the Volga German villages. Now this area, I was traveling down there with another Nazarene man from Flint, Michigan because he was a Volga German. And he knew that I too was a Volga German. You see, my mother was purebred Russian German. Her family was from the village of Messer in, uh, down in the Volga region. All of those villages had been pretty much destroyed during World War II. Stalin was afraid that the Germans would fight with the Russians, and so he wiped them out. And so today, the villages even have different names, and they're called, this one's now called Ust Zolicha. But this next picture I want to show you is the Lutheran church today in Ust Zolicha, where my great-grandfather was baptized in the old village of Messer, Russia. I went down to the village <laughs> with this other fella who had the same kind of heritage that I did and he was concerned about us planting Nazarene churches in our old area where so many of us have come from. And that day he and I went to a little village and um, this next picture you'll see is today what the villages look like down there. And we went to this village and he literally had made contact with his aunt that still lived in the village. Now you have to know what this was like for me to go into this village where my ancestors had come from. And that day we sat in one of those little houses, the only modern conveniences that they have, you can see they have electricity and they have gas, there's no indoor plumbing. Um, we sat in one of those little houses and you can see they still have ox-drawn or horse-drawn carts and stuff in these villages. The mud that day that I was there was, felt like it was knee-deep. And, um, and we were sitting there in this little house, and, and some of those people still can speak some broken German, and at that time my Russian wasn't very good, so we were talking in German that day. And we were trying to get through this conversation with Aunt Julia sitting there in this village house. And she's looking at us and she says, have I ever told you what it was like during the famine? You see, Stalin had forced collectivization of the farms. All the farms had been taken from them. They had to share food with everybody, but there were no crops planted for a year in Russia. That year, over two million people starved to death because of what the government had done. She said, did you know that we had to eat the grass like the horses? And then she said, you know, World War II came 
and Stalin was just sure that we were gonna fight with him. And she said, did I tell you about the night that they came and they got all the men from our village? And she said, and they buried them all alive on the edge of town. And she said, we sat here and we listened to the sounds in the night. And people, I sat there and I thought, why did my great grandfather leave? Why did I get to grow up the way that I did? Why did my family escape all of that? Why am I not sitting here in this village today? And it was this understanding that but by the grace of God, this could be me and this could be my life. And at that moment, God said to me, I didn't give you what you have for you to enjoy it for yourself. I have given you what you have so you can use it for me to make a difference in this world. You're not gonna live in a nice house in America or anything like that just because that's nice for you. You have that so you can use it for me. My vision continued one day as I'd been flying from Moscow to Frankfurt, Germany. And we were getting off the plane and they began to line us all up. They, we were getting off the plane and they actually came on the plane and they said, okay, you're gonna line up as you get off of this plane and if you have an American, or they said actually if you get out, hold up your passport. So you had to hold up your passport. As we were coming off the plane and you held up your passport, they actually separated us from the right, from the left. If you had the right type of passport, you were invited to freely pass into Germany. If you had the wrong type of passport, you were put in another line where you were gonna be harassed and your documents were gonna be checked and it was gonna be a problem for you to get through. And that day as I walked through that line holding up this little blue passport, they just waved me in with no problem and I thought, Wow, another one of those visionary moments. You know, I have done absolutely nothing to deserve this, nothing. I just happened to have been born to American parents. I wasn't even born in this country. I was born in Germany. I have a US State Department birth certificate and then they gave me one of these. Nothing that I have done. And yet I can walk freely around this world. I can go through borders that people would love to go through because I carry one of these. I am not a privileged person. And God said, what are you going to do with that little blue book that I have given you? It's not for you to enjoy. I gave you these tools so that you may be used in my kingdom. A vision that haunts me. Another vision was a couple of years ago, I read a book called Half the Sky. Some of you have heard about that. I know Rondi Smith came and shared a little bit about this. I read a book called Half the Sky, and there it began to put together some of the pieces of the visions that I had had, the visions of the girls in the streets in Moscow. The word, the, the phrase half the sky comes from a Chinese proverb that says, women hold up half the sky. As I read this book, I began to realize that there was a pattern to the stuff that I'd seen on the cities of Moscow. You see, there's a pattern that's happening in our world today. Did you know that today we have an estimated 37 million people in slavery? It's the most the number of people that have ever been in slavery in all of the history of the world. We think that we've abolished all of these things. And now all of a sudden I'm reading this and I'm saying, what in the world is going on in our world? But God began to answer my prayer, you see. Fifteen years in the making, a vision of what it was that God was trying to say to me. I want to take us back to my little story a minute. Dr. Seuss. You see, little Marco was so excited about what he had seen. He could not wait to get home and to tell his dad about it. But I have to tell you something, I don't like the end of the story because this story is far too true in terms of what happens to all of us. You see, he came around that corner, he had a story that no one could beat, and to think that he saw it on Mulberry Street, he said, but Dad sat quite calmly. Just draw up your stool and tell me the sights on the way home from school. There was so much that, to tell, I, I just couldn't begin, and then Dad looked at me sharply and he pulled on his chin. 
He frowned at me sternly from there in his seat. Was there nothing exciting to look at? No people to greet? Did nothing excite you or make your heart beat? (sighs) Nothing, I said, growing red as a beet, but a plain horse and a wagon on Mulberry Street. You see, I think that too often there are times that God begins to speak to his people and he actually gives us a vision so far beyond what is out there that our eyes really see on that street. Because you see, God gives us evangelism eyes to see the world through his eyes. And then we come home and we tell people at church or we tell other people about what it is that God is calling us to do. And then people just go, no, that's not really real. You can't do that. You can't get involved in doing that. And the reality is that you and I, on our own power, are not going to probably change the world. But you know what? It's not about me. It's about me partnering with God and simply saying, God, I give you everything I have because it's all from you anyways. And take it and use it for your kingdom because that's what you wanted. Do you remember what Paul said in his scripture, Acts 26, 19? After that, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. God has had to challenge me. It's been quite a journey where God is saying, will you be obedient to the vision from heaven? You see, people, God calls us into a deeply intimate relationship with him. But then he doesn't say that we get to just sit in that deeply intimate relationship with him. For you see, the one that we have fallen in love with, Jesus Christ, is out there in the world, and he's in that refugee camp. And he's with the girls down the street in Nashville. What do you see on your street, where is Jesus? And what might he be calling you into as we are to be his hands and his feet to this world? This is Pastor Kevin M. Ullman thanking you for joining us today for The Real Life. For more information, visit our website at www.nfcn.org and worship live with us at 510 Woodland Street at 9 a.m. every Sunday morning. May God bless you.